Much of what we see with evolution and life on the planet Earth is driven by efficiency. Bacteria are no exception. In fact, bacteria might be the most efficient groups of species on the planet Earth, even at the genomic level. Today, we're going to talk about how the bacterial genome is organized into gene packets called operons and how those operons are used to control the expression of genes in a very efficient and practical way in bacterial life. So stay tuned. Bacterial genomes are organized into single tight chromosomes that contain very little wasted space and very little wasted information. This is likely due to the fact that bacteria need to be incredibly efficient. The driving force behind bacterial evolution is likely their ability to reproduce faster than other members of their species. And one of the things we know about bacterial replication called binary fission, one of the rate limiting steps, one of the things that really slows them down greatly is their ability to replicate their DNA. So it shouldn't come as any surprise then that bacterial genomes are quite pared down. In other words, we've, they've removed over evolutionary time the majority of the information that's not important. Moreover, they've also organized the information that is contained in a way that those genes can be expressed in a very efficient manner. What we see in many bacterial species through, for many of their genes is they are organized into groups under a single control region called operons. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So when we talk about operons, operons are small segments of DNA that always have four basic components. The first are going to be multiple structural genes. So operons always encode multiple genes, but those genes encode proteins that are always involved in the same biochemical pathway. So for example, they might be genes that are all essential for breaking down lactose as a food source, or they might be responsible for the biosynthesis of tryptophan. But when we look at the structural genes of an operon, they always encode they always, they're genes that always encode proteins that are involved in the same biochemical pathway. The other thing that all of those genes are going to have is they're all going to be under control of a single gene promoter. So if you remember our conversation about transcription, gene promoters are little segments of DNA that lie upstream of a gene, and that is where RNA polymerase, as well as other regulatory factors like sigma factors, bind to promote the transcription of those downstream genes. But what's interesting about operons is there's going to be a little segment of DNA between the promoter and the, and the structural genes. This little region of DNA is called the operator. And the operator is going to be a landing site for another type of protein called the repressor, which we'll discuss in just a second. The fourth component of any operon is the regulatory region. The regulatory gene, which lies sometimes very far upstream of the rest of the promoter, often on a separate part of the chromosome, is a gene that encodes a protein known as the repressor. Now, the thing about the, the, the repressor is this. The gene to express the repressor is almost always on, and it's always producing low levels of the repressor. The repressor is quite simply a protein that helps to regulate the, transcription, the transcriptional output of the operon. Repressors are proteins, so they have a three-dimensional structure. And what's interesting about the three-dimensional structure of the repressor proteins is that it can change. They always have an active conformation and an inactive conformation. In other words, they can be turned on and they can be turned off as environmental conditions change. And this is what's going to help regulate the transcriptional output of the given operon. Now, when the repressor is in the on conformation, when it is active, it will open up a DNA binding domain that will allow it to bind specifically to the DNA sequence that forms the operator of the operon that it regulates. Okay, So if a repressor is on, it is going to bind to an operator, effectively shutting transcription at that operon off. So repressors and operons have equal and opposite activities. If a repressor is on, it's going to repress gene transcription at that operon, which means the operon is off. However, if the repressor is off, it will not be able to bind to the DNA. It will not be able to repress transcription, which means the operon will be on. So if a repressor is on, the operon is off. And if a repressor is off, the operon is on. Now, there are two different varieties of operons that we see in bacteria. 
One is called a repressible operon and the other is called an inducible operon. And we'll talk about both using an example found in E. coli uh, to describe them. The first type of operon that we'll talk about is a repressible operon. The typical operon that we discuss in bacteria that is a repressible operon is called the trip operon. So the trip operon encodes five structural genes, trip A through E, that encode five proteins that are necessary to biosynthesize tryptophan, which is just an amino acid needed by all living things to make proteins. Sometimes E. coli has to make its own tryptophan. Other times, if it can get tryptophan dietarily, because it's living in somebody's gut that maybe ate just a big turkey dinner, and now it's getting amino acids that way, it doesn't need to make its own tryptophan. And obviously, it's much more energy efficient to absorb tryptophan than it is to biosynthesize it, which, of course, is going to be an endergonic reaction that requires the input of energy. But E. coli needs to assume that under basal or normal conditions, it will not have access to tryptophan and will have to make its own. The trip operon is referred to as a repressible operon quite simply because the repressor is always made in the off conformation. So when the repressor is when the trip repressor is translated, that DNA binding domain is not available. It's closed off and it cannot bind to the operator. So under normal conditions, RNA polymerase is allowed to bind to the promoter. It zips right through the operator and begins transcription at the transcriptional start site transcribing the entire mRNA needed to make all five of those trip proteins and continues to do so until told not to. How will it be told not to? Well, if tryptophan levels rise in the cell because either tryptophan is not being used or because the cell has found a way to acquire tryptophan, tryptophan can actually bind to the trip repressor and convert it into its active conformation. In this case, tryptophan is acting as a co-repressor. Co-repressors act to activate a repressor. And because the tryptophan repressor is now active, it will now bind to the DNA at the operator location, which is always right between the promoter and the structural genes, thereby physically blocking the ability of RNA polymerase to actually read through the operator and transcribe those genes. Now what eventually happens is all of the tryptophan will be used up because they're doing protein synthesis or for some other purpose. Tryptophan levels will drop, the co-repressor will no longer be present. It will no longer be able to activate the trip repressor. The trip repressor will become inactive, fall off of the operator, and then transcription of the trip operon can begin again. Inducible operons are the same, but also the exact opposite. So the behavior is exactly the same, except in the case of the LAC operon, which is our canonical inducible operon in E. coli, the LAC repressor is always made in the active conformation. See, lac, the LAC operon encodes three enzymes that are needed to digest lactose. But lactose is an available resource for E. coli, but it's not the preferred resource for E. coli. E. coli would much rather digest glucose as an energy source. And on top of that, lactose isn't always available. Remember, lactose is milk sugar. Now, is milk sugar available in the gut of someone who's consumed dairy lately? Sure is, but under normal conditions, no. So in other words, there's no need to have those three enzymes involved in lactose catabolism available the majority of the time. So when the lac repressor gets produced, it's in its active or on conformation, which means its DNA binding domain is available and it binds to the operator. So it sits right between the promoter and the structural genes, blocking the ability of RNA polymerase to read through and transcribe those the genes encoding those three enzymes. So, how do then we end up how do we end up getting the expression of those enzymes when it's needed? Well, simply put, when lactose is available, lactose can act as an inducer. An inducer is a chemical that when binding to a repressor inactivates the repressor. So what happens is lactose or one of its uh, closely related chemicals allolactose binds to the lac repressor, converting it into its inactive conformation, it can no longer bind to the operator. That then allows RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter, zip right through, transcribe those three enzyme genes uh, needed to make the three lactase enzymes, and they can go on and use lact lactose as, a, as an energy source. Now, what happens over time? Well, the lactose gets degraded. There's no longer enough lactose or allolactose around to act as an inducer. And all of a sudden, the lac repressor is back into the active conformation, 
shutting down transcription at that operon again. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. What's the, the beauty of, of operons is they're self-regulating. The cell itself doesn't have to do all that much. It allows the cell to respond quite rapidly to changing conditions. If a co-repressor is present, all of a sudden we shut down transcription. If an inducer is present, all of a sudden we activate transcription at certain operons. It's a really neat and efficient way to rapidly regulate the expression of genes in bacteria. But one of the things we know now is that operons are almost exclusively a prokaryotic way of regulating gene expression. Very few eukaryotes have operons, and those that do have very few of them. So we do not see operonic transcriptional regulation in eukaryotes. It appears to be relegated specifically to prokaryotes. Now, the other downside to uh, regulating gene transcription this way is it's kind of all on or all off for the most part. Either you're expressing those genes or you're not. But there are some exceptions, and one of those exceptions goes back to the LAC operon and involves a protein called catabolite activator protein, or CAP. So, as I said before, E. coli would, more, would much rather use glucose as an energy source than lactose. But what happens if both glucose and lactose are present in the same cell? How then can the E. coli cell then say, I just want to use the glucose and I'll save the lactose as a reserve? Well, here's what happens. When lactose is present, it will derepress the lac operon. It will act as an inducer and pull the lac repressor off of the operator. That would allow RNA polymerase to bind and read right through the operator and transcribe those genes. However, it turns out that RNA polymerase has very little affinity for the promoter region of the lac repressor. What that means is even though it can, RNA polymerase has a hard time binding to that region of the genome but it can be assisted in doing so by the presence of another protein called CAP. So what happens if glucose and lactose are present? CAP is not active, but as the glucose begins to disappear, the cell will run low on ATP. It won't be able to produce energy and start looking for backup sources of energy. As the ATP levels drop, it'll lead to the production of an ATP derivative called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then can activate CAP. CAP then goes and searches out RNA polymerases and recruits them to the promoter of operons like the LAC operon. So all of a sudden, now that glucose is gone, the LAC operon is now active and lactose can be used as a substrate to produce energy. So what happens if glucose gets reinduced? Well, or it gets reintroduced, well, all of a sudden you'll get high levels of ATP, CAP will no longer be active, and then lactose will no longer be used as a substrate until the glucose runs out again. So proteins like CAP are a neat way where E. coli can sort of fine-tune their gene expression to favor one, one catabolite over another as a source of energy. So today we talked about operons. Operons are uh, regions of the bacterial genome or the prokaryotic genome where we have multiple genes all involved in the same biochemical pathway under the control of a single gene promoter. Uh, it's a very efficient way of regulating gene transcription, but it's found exclusively or almost exclusively in prokaryotic organisms like bacteria. I hope you guys learned a lot today. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you guys real soon.